Thank you so much. Um, and thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. It's, it's such an honor to, to, uh, to have the opportunity to talk to you and, um, and, and to come here and, and just be in, in, around a lot of people that I know here also. It's just it's terrific. Um, uh, to, to begin, um, you know, I, I photographed a lot of conflict for the New York Times, um, and I, I, I didn't plan it out that way. I just kind of, you know, my, my hire at the paper coincided with the beginning of two big American wars, um, obviously Afghanistan and Iraq. And, um, you know, after a while, you're, you know, you're kind of going to these places. Your name just kind of keeps coming up in their Rolodex, so they keep calling you. Um, and uh, those wars lasted a long time. And after a while, you kind of look in the mirror, and uh, at least for me, I realized I went gray. And uh, a lot of time had passed. And some of my friends here who, who are sitting at this table, too, are a little bit more gray hair as well. <laughs> um, it's 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 uh, you know a lot of what we do is transport ourselves to to bad places. I mean that's that's kind of the big part of this job is we we, we take ourselves from our homes and our loved ones and we put ourselves in very unfamiliar places where often it's very hostile, and that comes with considerable risk. It's, it's rarely a sunny place to be. Other people in this room, I know I'm not talking to, 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 to rookies here. You've all done amazing things with your careers, and, 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 and a good number of you have taken risks of your own. And uh, it's, uh, I'm a little scared and humbled to be up here talking to you. <laughs> people ask me why I take the risks that I do to, to, to do this job? And it's, it's always kind of a, that's a difficult question to answer. Um, and and when we, we were just talking about Carlotta Gall and you know, that she always says like, you know, picture is never worth your life. Obviously that's true, but um, you know, I'm, I'm, this work can, can reward you really in amazing ways and it can also punish you um, in a completely blindsiding way. Um, I'm not a thrill seeker. Um, I, I, I really dislike the, the term uh, 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 adrenaline junkie. You know, when people say, are you adrenaline junkie? I say, you know, that's, I, I find kind of offensive. They're, they're much easier and safer ways to, to satisfy boredom than, than going into a war zone. I mean, you can go to, <laughs> onto an outward bound course or something like that. Um, we take these risks because we, we want to validate what's happening around the world. And we hope that by being there to document it firsthand, that that, that will bring truth and hopefully change, positive change. Uh, no one can pay you any amount of money to do this type of work. It's not the kind of thing that you do for that. It's, um, and really for, for, for the type of work that I do as a photographer, it's really, I, I feel like my job is kind of a trade. Like I get, I get uh, I'm 95% of it is just to get to places, kind of to, to read body language, to get past people who are trying to stop me from taking my pictures, from doing my work. That's the biggest part of this job, in my opinion, at least. The other 5% is once you're actually there and you realize you're in that moment and you push the shutter on your camera and you start getting what you arrived for. And, you know, I'm, I'm very lucky uh, to have my job at the New York Times. It's, it's like to have a big audience for the pictures. And I don't think that a picture is really, you know, it's not worth going out there and putting yourself at risk and putting other people around you at risk if the picture is not going to be seen in, in some way. It, it has to be published. To me, that picture doesn't have any value without it being published. And, and, and 
the, the, the risk in, in, in taking those chances and going to places where there's combat or any kind of, it doesn't have to be a war, it can be any place where, where people are going to be hostile. I think everyone has like an internal thermostat that, that determines your level of, of how much you can push it. And, and, and I know people who are way above me. Um, mine sways a lot. It goes very, very much in, in two directions. Um, in the case we were, as you're talking about Westgate Mall, um, I'm gonna show some pictures. And everything I'm gonna show you tonight is really recent work. I, I kind of wanted to, to, to show you stuff that's been happening in, uh, you know, in my life recently. Um, you know, this was a, a moment that came, it was almost like a sign, you know, like you, you, you carry around a camera for, for, your, for your whole life thinking maybe, maybe something will happen. Um, in this case, it did. Uh, um, I, 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 this is where I live in Nairobi, a big, big shopping mall that, um, that came under attack by Somali militants, Al-Shabaab. When I first arrived, it was really, um, you know, it, 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 it was immediately clear there was something very bad happening inside. You know, all these people were running out. Um, it was very disorganized. And um, a lot of people had been, you know, it was clear within just a few minutes that, um, you know, people had been shot. Uh, this woman in the center actually died not long after this picture was taken. Um, uh, she, she seemed fine. She's, you know, injured, ran past me. But there was no facility to, to, to help people. There was only a couple of ambulances, and people were literally bleeding to death on the sidewalk. One of the problems of, 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 uh, of, of being in a place like Kenya. Um, as I kind of approached, uh, you know, it wasn't an immediate uh, decision to go inside the mall. There was so much going on outside. Um, and bodies and pe injured people and emotion and um, but really I could con still hear gunfire inside and it became clear to me that the real story was inside the mall and I, I, I saw an opportunity to go in um, and it was really one of these moments that that I thought you know what what am I doing I, I uh, you know, there's a lot of gunfire still happening. You can see here in the foreground, a man's been killed, a lot of bodies around, and, and very disorganized. I mean, this is a place where the police and the military are very undertrained. And it was gruesome. These photographs, you know, they're not easy to look at, but, you know, this was mass murder, mostly headshots, women, children, um, it, it was it was uh, pretty amazing. We were talking about this picture before. Something is like you never get uh, you, the, the, that happens as you you know breaking news happens around you, and you never get to actually know what happened to people. It's very hard to follow up. Um, and and this woman is laying here with her two children. She laid there for four hours. Um, and and the, the strange thing about this mall is that there was this, this music, the mall music, continued to play. And she sang those songs to those kids and had to keep that little boy calm for four hours while people were literally getting killed around her. She got in touch with me uh, after she saw some of my pictures run. And I actually had a, like a, a, a video Skype <laughs> talk with her. She's on her iPad with her husband and her family. And I saw these kids running around and playing and having dinner. And it was just so... So great to, to be at, at, like, at something so, such a tragedy, and then to have actually one happy story at the end of it. Um, it was difficult to work there. Um, constantly, the, the police and military kicking me out, getting back in, worried that my discs would get taken away. Um, but it, it was, was really, for me, this, this, one of the things that I was actually thinking about while I was taking these pictures is that this is not only just about this, what happened, what was happening, another African tragedy, but, you know, these mass shootings, you have you know, Sandy Hook Elementary in Connecticut and, um, you know, a tourist island in, in, in Norway that is, is uh, uh, attacked, uh, these mass shootings that, that really tap into the fear of of all of us and can happen anywhere in the world. 
um, and you know, no life is worth any any less than than another. Um, I was really, you know, we, we, we hope to learn through our peers about how to how to become better journalists, how to how to in my case, how to operate in the field and, and stay safe and alive. Um, I was really fortunate to have Chris Chivers by my side, better part of the last 10 years. Um, you know, that, that guy is like the closest thing to, to a, a textbook education on, on, on surviving in a war zone. Um, you know, I'll always be indebted to him for that. And, and um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard for people who, who don't have that, who don't, who, who, you know, whether they're freelance or just don't have that buddy system to bounce off of. Um, one of the places that, that really allows you to, to, to gauge the type of risk that you take is Gaza, where I was this summer. Um, this is a place that, that's always been very <coughs> dear to me as far as, you know, anytime something happens, I, I really do my best to try to go. It's, it's a place that you can work with, with an enormous amount of freedom. It's small. It doesn't take very long to get to places. Um, people are brave, the drivers, the translators. They've grown up with this. It, it's really uh, represents everything about what a, what a, what a, what a photojournalist would, would hope as far as a place that you can cover and, and, and make decisions in the field to, to how far you want to push it. Um, this was, I had been there the year prior to um, and, and, and conflict that I thought was bad, but was very much not as bad as this one. This was really, really pushed it. And I had a different feeling this time around. I was very, I felt very angry about the amount of civilian casualty I was seeing, especially children. And I found myself, you know, I'd go to the morgue and, and they'd, they'd pull out another tray with three, four kids on it. And, and I, I almost just didn't feel like taking pictures. It was like, I was more disgusted than anything else. It's like, you know, are these pictures making a difference? Um, one day I was, uh, I had been out working, you know, shooting pictures like these. This is, you go out early in the morning. It's really routine. You go out, you, you shoot a funeral. You see what kind of bombings happened the night before. You go by the morgue. There's, there's, there is very much kind of like this, this strange routine that happens in, in places like this. Um, I'd been out in the morning, and I went back to my room with my, my driver and uh, having a Coca-Cola, taking a break. It's very hot out. We heard a large explosion uh, just outside the, my, my hotel on the beachfront. And... Uh, I looked out and I saw smoke rising um, from, from a seawall and uh, a group of boys running across the beach away from it. And a bomb, had, a rocket had hit on the beach. My immediate instinct was to grab my flak jacket and cameras and, and to rush out to see what happened. And as I turned to grab my equipment, another explosion, this one closer, cracked outside the window. When I looked out, those, those very boys that I had seen running were all dead, just lifeless on the beach. My driver started just screaming under, uncontrollably. We ran down to the edge of the beach, and, and uh, uh, um, um, I, I, I reached the sand, and that's kind of like where my, my thermostat said, don't go any further. Two big rockets had already hit in a big open area. And it was strange because... There were no people out there yet. It was very quiet. And that's one of the things about combat that, you know, unlike, I mean, a lot of you have experience in this, but, but it's, it's, it can, it's never kind of what you think it's going to be like, the sounds and the smells. This point is very quiet, and a group of people came. They rushed out onto the, the, the beach, and that's when I joined them. Uh, and, and they, you know, scooped up these, these lifeless boys. And I actually, um, 
my driver was so distraught after this, taking these pictures, that I had to, that he fainted. And I found myself in an ambulance with my driver taking him to the hospital. You know, the, the, these, these things really take a toll on the civilian population um, in, 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 in incredible ways. It's uncommon for the paper to run a paper picture like that one on the front page. They did. I, I, I don't often make an argument um, unless I really, really think that it's important. In this case, I did. And, and they put it out there. And I, 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 you know, I, I really hoped it, it, it underscored the rising civilian death toll to Israel's assault there. And um, you, know, you, you hope that those pictures can, can maybe speed up a ceasefire to advance discussions. And people will see those pictures. That's, that's our goal. The way that Gaza permits us to make those decisions about risk, about when to run out onto the beach, about when to, to go out driving around at first light, whether it's still too dangerous, these things, it's, it's that, that kind of arena is getting smaller and smaller. A lot of what we rely on is luck. Um, and luck works until you get a until you uh, until it doesn't you know as long as you get away with it taking risks is worth it um, I lost that bet in Libya in 2011 stayed too long in a place that was being attacked by uh, um, Gaddafi fighters ran into a uh, militia checkpoint out in the desert really the worst case scenario where as as I was being captured with my colleagues their checkpoint was simultaneously attacked by the people that I had just been with. So uh, we're being dragged out of the car while bullets are hitting our car from the so-called friendly side. Um, they immediately executed my driver. Uh, two of their, uh, the, the, the Gaddafi uh, military fighters were, were, were killed in the incoming fire, um, and, and we really you know, narrowly escaped with our lives. We were lucky. Um, this was kind of a beginning of a very, very dark time for journalists. Um, Libya kind of started to transform into a, a, a multi-stage militia. Of course, Ms. Rada and Holmes claimed the lives of some of our very good friends. It was like a succession of waves that changed the way we, we cover some of the darkest parts of the world. A lot of people decided it wasn't worth the risk anymore, that this is just, you know, enough is enough. Too much is happening. It's got too dangerous out there. And, or the, the organizations that, that, that send us out there decided that they weren't going to send them anymore. Um, you know, even people who wanted to go. So you get this much smaller group going. And in... And, and, in 2012, um, you know, it was la the last time I was in Syria, again with Chris Chivers. Uh, we were in, staying in Aleppo in a, a small apartment, and you know, this is one of these things that it was very hard to to, to work. Um, jumping out of the car, taking pictures from inside the car, spending two minutes in a place—very frustrating. Um, you could really kind of feel the noose tightening. On, on our ability to work. And, and it, it, we, we, we discussed at the time, you know, this, let's get everything we can now because soon this place is going to be overrun and we're not going to be able to come here anymore. And, and it's, it's really hard because this is an important story, not just in, in, in Syria, but in Iraq and, and all throughout the region that ISIS now controls. Um, risk taking again we were driving around and we saw we stumbled up on this little demonstration of about a hundred people waiting a black flag people denouncing the free syria army and calling for islamic rule um bad group of guys we decided that we you know we had a quick quick uh meeting on the spot you know let's Let's jump out. I'll shoot some pictures. He's going to like roll a couple seconds of video on his phone or whatever. Maybe talk to somebody, get back in the van and go. 
moment we got out of the vehicle, we realized it was a bad idea. The crowd suddenly turned on us. We went back to the vehicle. They surrounded it. I remember looking out the windows and seeing, you know, all these faces and hands slapping and the, the rocking the, the van. And it was just that, that doomsday moment of, like, what the hell were we thinking jumping out at, at that type of demonstration? Like, what made us even think we could get away with that? Um, it was through our amazing two translators and our drivers uh, that they managed to, to talk our way out of that. Um, and I, I just couldn't believe it because, I mean, a guy got in our vehicle with a gun and, and it demanded that we go to their, what he called their base for questioning. And we just knew that we would never see the light of day again. This is the one picture I took at the demonstration when we got out before the crowd suddenly noticed us and, and turned. You know, uh, uh, Others have not been so fortunate as us in that situation there. Um, you know, we've watched helplessly as fellow journalists, um, you know, have been very publicly executed um, and these, you know, on the, uh, displayed on the internet, uh, this, this fear campaign has, has worked. It's not only terrified journalist population, but an entire region of the world. Um, you know, John Cantley is, is, you know, continues to be used as this kind of puppet journalist, you know, masquerading as a, as a uh, news broadcaster. Um, drone camera videos, I'm sure you've all seen them, they're very slick. Um, and we have to ask ourselves, you know, what, what we are accepting as news. We're not able to go there. The New York Times doesn't go there anymore to Syria. Um, and, you know, how can we accurately report on the ground without correspondents walking through that territory, collecting shell casings, studying blast patterns, having that amazing kind of photographer correspondent team that creates such rich journalism that comes back to the readers and, and in a way that, that, that is just the, 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 the most valuable way. You know, do we lo rely solely on local contacts to do that? Um, that can work. There are some amazing journalists there. Um, you know, for, there, there was a, unfortunately for photography, it's, you know, we, there was a teenage Syrian photographer last year. They think he was about 17 years old. They, they he was, many argue he's a lot younger who was shooting for Reuters. Um, he was killed during a battle for a hospital. And Reuters came under a lot of criticism about what allowed them to be employing somebody, you know, without proper training, sending basically a child up into frontline war. Um, so that's the problem that we face today. And do we, do we you know, we're, we're not any longer deciding, like, do we go down this road or not? Um, or should we go to that hospital or not? We're, we're deciding whether we go to entire regions or entire countries anymore. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I've never been entirely shut out of a country until now. I, there's always been a way in. I'm sure a lot of you sitting around here know, like, no matter where you go, there's always some way in. There's always some side that you can work with. Um, and that's becoming smaller and more difficult to, to find out there. Um, so we're kind of entering a different, a different era and, and, and that type of journalism. And, uh, and uh, that would be something I hope that, uh, you know, we think we're now going into a Q&A, but, uh, but um, I appreciate you listening to what I have to say about, about the work I do and, and kind of some of my thoughts about it. And um, that's it, yeah, thank you.